Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to welcome Pastor Russell this morning. Well, the last time Pastor Russell was here, we were so blessed, weren't we? Amen. We had a great service. And uh, Pastor Russell, you know, is a pioneer. He pioneered churches. And uh, he's an amazing man of God. I really come to love him very much. In my heart, I really feel, you know, we are one in spirit. And uh, he pastors the Upper Yara uh, Church of Christ, correct? Yeah. It's an amazing church. God is doing some amazing, amazing things in that area as well. He's, he's just been released also to the body of Christ. He loves going out and ministering. And we are so blessed this morning to have him come. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand as he comes to minister God's word. Keep your hearts open. God will speak to you and God will, you know, minister to you in a very powerful way this morning. I believe that. Amen. Praise God. He promised to sing for us. So we are waiting for a treat this morning. Yeah, I must also start singing. <coughs> I'll probably empty the church, Pastor Russell, if I sang. <laughs> you need a mic, don't you? Yeah. Can we plug in, please? Can you help? to be able to not have to wear masks again oh i just feel like i can breathe it's just so lovely and um to be able to see people's faces and and to be able to worship and sing how was it the instruction that we had was sing but don't sing too loud and don't spit on the person next to you it's just ridiculous but that's the way it is so good to be back at church to feel like um God's doing something good, but we're never going back to what we were. Have you got your safety belts on? Are you ready for what God's going to do next? Oh, if we knew, I don't think we'd say hallelujah, Pastor Ronald. <laughs> it's a, um, we're just watching, knowing, holding Jesus' hand, walking with him every day, but knowing that um, we're not going to know everything that is up ahead. We have to trust. What are the two conditions of the covenant? Trusting and obeying. That's the conditions. So good to be with you. Let's just pray before we start. And I want to, because it's Mission Sunday, I want to sing a missionary song. And I hope it's a song that will probably torture you during the week when you get out of here because it's up there with... Um, baby shark you know that song it's going to stick in your brain and you're going to say i wish pastor russell hadn't taught us that but anyhow we're going to do it anyway father we really thank you for today we thank you that lord you're working and you are building your church and that father that we can just rest in you and know that lord you're in front of us you're behind us you're protecting us you're empowering us you're enabling your church to stand in this hour and, Lord, to be a light in this world and to be salt in the earth. And, Father, we just pray as we worship you more and as we open your word that, Jesus, you will speak to us so clearly, that you will take away the scales from our eyes, that you will enable us, Lord, to see what the Spirit of God is doing to the church and saying to the church in this hour. We just pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. This is a song that, and Trelawney, maybe I'll get you up here to help me sing it. Would that be good? This is a song that um, has two parts to it, and we're going to split you down the centre. But this side here, tr with Trelawney leading, is going to be, this is what you have to sing. It's, we're going to have a, a wonderful heavenly choir. And 
and then I'll sing the verses. But please don't mess it up because I like this song. So you have to sing your part really well. So your, your part goes like this. Ooh, wee, ooh, 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 ooh. singing it all right <laughs> come on now put your heart into it please some feeling that's a little bit better i can't quite hear you you've got you've got the bass part and your part goes like this Um chaka, 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 um. All right. Can you do? I didn't hear any. I just heard a lot of people laughing, but no real. Hey, this is serious, please. I wanna, I wanna hear you sing some um chakas, please. Come on. It's sort of the Maori bit, isn't it? Isn't it? It's not. Oh, don't blame the Maoris. <laughs> um chaka, 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 I think now can we risk it? Can we risk it for a biscuit, please? Well, I think we have to stand to do it, please, because I want you to concentrate. Don't, when you're singing that, don't listen to them because they'll put you off, all right? And the same for you. Let's hear how it goes together. Let's start. Um chaka, um chaka, um chaka, um chaka. tell you I think you're gonna have to get a bit of you're gonna have to get a bit of um, I don't know what it is a bit of grooviness I know my kids when I say hey groovy cool man they look at me as if I'm from another planet but we've got to get groovy can we do it one more time please and then I'm gonna sing the chorus and as I said don't mess up my bit all right Um chaka, um chaka, um chaka, um chaka. Oh, we um chaka, um chaka, um chaka, um chaka. Oh, we chaka. I can't hear you. Be not in 
tangled again with the yoke of bondage. be seated <laughs> you know as a mission song that's been sung the lord gave me that years ago but it, it's been sung through the hills and the valleys of the philippines in little village churches it's been sung throughout borneo through right through the cities of J jakarta and other places through indonesia it's been sung as well now i think we can say in the in the suburbs and the blurbs of roeville tomorrow morning you're going to wake up and you're going to go, ooh, ooh. oh, get that out of my brain. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. Thanks you for putting up with that. I just want to talk a little bit about what I think the Lord is doing in the earth, but also just as a spark, I think I want to talk to young people here. How many young people have we got? Well, that's a bit weird. <laughs> some, some of you need a correction, I think. <laughs> but, you know, that's it. You're only as old as how you feel inside. I feel like I'm 30. You know, like I feel like I'm 30. The body doesn't want to do what it used to do. But um, can I go to this one? Thank you. But it's sort of... For young people today, this is what I believe. I believe that God has put a fire in the spirit of young people, that there is a generation that needs to get ready because they have the energy, they have the calling of God, they have a destiny, and look out, this is their time. You've come to the kingdom of God for such a time as this. And for those that have the energy and the fire and the surrender in your heart to say, Lord, speak for your servant hears lord here am i use me for those that have got surrendered hearts look out god is going to empower god is going to put you in places you could never imagine and that's what he's looking for he's looking for young people especially who are surrendered and who are willing and who are able and who are ready for the things that are about to break on the earth you're going to be the trailblazers. You are going to be those who carry the torch. You're going to be the ones that carry the luggage for the older people who've still got fire in their belly. And get ready because I think we haven't seen anything yet. And I see this as a destiny. There's something about this generation that I work with a lot of Gen Ys and millennials and you know, they, they are amazing. Is that this one? Which one? Testing. That they're, they're amazing because they have a drive in them and often they want to be promoted within 10 minutes of getting into the workplace. You have to get ready for the, <laughs> the downside. But they are the best networkers that you could ever imagine. They just build bridges. They build relationships. They build friendships. They don't often respect the hierarchical systems that are there. But they're also radical. They have a whole vocabulary around 
there's things that I don't understand that they talk about. Like if, if one of them says cohort one more time, I'm going to scream. If one of them says we're going to um, take that offline or we're going to innovate or we're going to whatever, they have a whole language. But the thing I think about this generation is that God has built a radical spirit in them. That, yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> That, there's, that there is something of, of where they want to push the boundaries. That never has there been so many young people who want to, they've all got their bucket lists. They all want to pioneer. They have this sense of, um, I, want to, I want to break the mould. I want to be different. I want to leave a mark. So they have to be able to say that they've jumped out of an aeroplane that they've jumped off a bridge on a bungee. How many young people have bungee jumped here? Oh, you're all wise. How many older people have bungee jumped here? Oh, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, um, it's something that God's put into the spirit of this generation that says that they're specially equipped for a job that's about to happen. I just want to pay tribute to someone that I've worked with for over 30, nearly 40 years. And his name was Pastor Albert Lastimosa from the Philippines. Him and his wife, Lita, are pioneers. And we often... Is that better? We often used to sit down and plan things and talk tactics and strategies. You know, that there, for those that want to break new ground in God, you've got to get a vision of the possibilities. And Pastor Albert and I first met back in the late 1980s, but we were the same age. My tribute to him is that he passed away two weeks ago and went to be with the Lord young and sudden but what a man of god and what a trailblazer he raised up something like about three or four hundred churches in tribal areas his church just out of our city is also a, a trailblazing church his son samuel is now pastoring it but when i some of you remember pastor albert that he was he was a formerly an executive with Coca-Cola down in General Santos City in Mindanao. And he was someone who was always had the call of God on him. He was executive material and he was always a manager and a good manager, but he grew a church everywhere he went, he grew churches. And then eventually the call of God came to him and he, he had to leave his job. But during the radical times of the late 1980s, 1990s, 2000, early 2000s, Mindanao has been a hot spot for, for um, civil war, for different um, pressure groups and, and military groups. There are at least three Islamic armies down there. It's an Islamic training area. It's a training area for ISIS at the moment. That it's also been a place for private armies because of drug lords. And the government hasn't had control of it either. But then in the early stages when we were involved there, it was also the NPA, which was the Communist People's Army. And they were very, very um, um, involved in, in dealing, uh, attacking government installations and trying to take over Mindanao. And in Davao City itself, Davao City became called the Killing Fields in the late 1980s. Pastor Albert was someone who was in his suburb of Davao City. Um, their particular suburb was a training area for the NPA soldiers. And on graduation, they had to have killed someone. That was part of their, their induction. And in that village, 
there'd been two what they call barangay captains, which are like the mayor and the police chief in one. Two of them had been assassinated. And Albert, and a lot of the Christians had left this suburb because of the oppression and the war that was going on. And then they came, the community came to Albert. His church was the only one that remained. It was just incredibly um, risky that they came and asked him if he'd be the next Barangay captain. So he became the mayor and the police chief of the village which put a giant target on his back. And I remember when I, I met him the year before this, but when I went to stay with him, he picked me up from the airport and he picked me up in, do like, you think you're gonna keep a low profile if you're the new Barangay chief and the two previous ones were assassinated. And he, he picked me up in his little red Volkswagen. And at that stage, there'd been 39 attempts on his life. The Sparrow teams, as they call them, assassination squads, had attempted to kill him 39 times. And as he's driving me from the airport, we're driving through a banana plantation and he said, oh, Russell, this is where they tried to ambush me last week. And I was wishing he didn't have a red Volkswagen because <laughs> I'm not brave, but then he said, you know, I heard later that they were lying in ambush for me and I went through, but they didn't see me. So it's like these literal angels were with him constantly and they protected him. And he lived in a hotbed of, of war and destruction. And it came to a head too where he was preaching in his church. They kept ringing him saying, you're a dead man, you're a dead man. And he'd say to him, well, my hands, my life is, is in God's hands. You know where I live. Do, what you, do your best. And he wasn't arrogant, but he just had a trust in Jesus that he would look after him. And he was preaching in the church this day in Mandug, which is the suburb he was in. And three Sparrow team members came with AK-47s, they put them through the window of the church and they fired to shoot him while he was preaching, but the gun jammed. They saw these big tall people next to him and then they ran off. And as they ran off, one of the guns went off and shot one of these young men in the foot. And the Marines, the government Marines, captured them and then because because Albert was the barangay captain police chief they put them into his custody but instead of putting them in jail he took them into his home with his wife Lita and his kids and he fed them and he looked after them and his whole message has always been love your enemies now as I had a lot to do with that church, those three men became his youth leaders, his pastors, his backbone. And yeah, praise the Lord. But over the years, his message was constantly that. He had another time when a, an assassin was, he could see him, he was, he was waiting outside to get him. And he'd been there all day and um, his wife, Lita, saw the guy, Albert had gone out and they were waiting for him to return. Lita saw this guy outside and she went and got bread and she got water and that and she went and took it to the assassin and gave it to him and fed him. Such a powerful thing. Um, the church grew, his ministry grew and as a soldier of the Lord, it was a privilege to work with him my brother Rowan has continued all the work in the Philippines and he's over there once or twice a year till COVID hit. But it's just wonderful to see people living the life authentically. When I was there one Sunday morning, they said to us, the NPA have broken through. They've just shot someone down the river. Now you're in a church, about this size 
and you get the news, the NPA are coming. What do you think you do? They all got on their faces. They all started praying. And it's, it's, I've never heard prayer like it. It wasn't prayer out of fear. It was prayer of weeping and crying. But it was a prayer of like when, when you're getting close to the Lord, like we have in worship this morning, when you lock your heart in where Jesus is and when you throw yourself on Jesus, it's like when you're in worship, it's like a shield. It's like this barrier that you feel and you know is around you. And they were just on their faces weeping and crying. And I tell you, I, I've never prayed like it. You know, to be in a situation where it is full persecution and life and death. I didn't feel worthy to be there because I'm not a, I wasn't a good prayer like that and still aren't. But it's something to behold when you see people who are, I, I could get out of there within two weeks, but living in it, breathing in it every day. They, this was a church that was clean. This is a church that kept themselves clean because every day could be your last day. That they walk with the Lord and they talk with him and they saw things and the miracles that they saw. There was a way of living and in the zone like that, that just, that I will never forget. And the other thing I'll never forget is, you know, concrete floors. And you know what it's like in the Philippines. The dogs come into church. I hate it when the dogs come into church, that they do. And when you get up at the end of it after a prayer time, the floor, whether it's floorboards or concrete, is covered in tears. That's the sort of church I want to be in. That where you, where you see desperate, hungry, soft and surrendered hearts, real tears, not tears of fear, but tears of, Lord, an ache in your heart to say, Jesus, I want to see your face. I want to see your face. Those sorts of tears. It was, um, it's something that you just can't get out of your mind. And you come back to Australia. I used to always get back around at Christmas time and have to walk through a supermarket and listen to jingle bells or some other piped can music. Watch everybody with smiling faces. It was such a culture shock to come out of those zones and come back to Australia with the food and with the... Now, I know in COVID I have put on weight. Some of you have noticed. I know that I did. I admit it. <laughs> but I think that the call of God on us is to raise the hands of those like you are in Cambodia like you are in Sri Lanka and in Timor, is to get alongside them as partners and lift their hands up and support them in whatever way you can. To, to be vicariously part of who they are and where they walk and where they suffer. That's the mission call. It's like when Jesus went in to raise up the, the girl that, was, that had died. And... Elijah did the same. You know what? The, the prayer was that Jesus puts his hands on her hands when she's dead and puts his face on her face. And Elijah did this and then breathed life. And she came back from the dead. You know that there's something about mission that involves us putting our hands on their hands and our face on their face and vicariously walking where they walk and being a part of their life, eating what they eat, drinking what they drink, wearing what they wear, that we become lost and part of who they are. That's the mission call that Jesus gives us. And when we can do that, then things happen. I just want to read from Matthew in chapter 16, just a couple of little thoughts, and then I want to have time to be able to pray for people before you run out for your sausage. I said to Pastor Ronald, it's just not fair that you get me to preach on a day 
when there's a smell of onions and the smell of sausages cooking, because they're going to go, will you hurry up? <laughs> I'm so hungry. <laughs> but I just want to read this to you from Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus is um, saying in verse 13, who do men say that I am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, Jesus isn't surprised by this, but I think there's this amazing gladness in his heart because he's heard it through the lips of his disciples and that the illumination and the revelation that has come to Peter, that's what he addresses next. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father who is in heaven, and I say to you that you are Peter. And you know Peter's name means pebble or little rock or something like that in the, in the, um, in the Greek language. And so Jesus is having this play on the words as well. And he's saying to Peter, and I say unto you, Peter, and your name means rock, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he commanded his disciples that they shall tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Now we know that there is a truth that the message that Jesus is giving Peter, there is an individual message here that he's saying to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, Peter. And upon, upon this rock, he's used his name, but really he's not talking about it. The spiritual message here is it's not just the rock and not Peter's name. He's, he's talking about the revelation. The rock is the revelation. The rock that he's going to build his church on is the revelation that he is the Christ, the son of a living God. He is the Messiah, that he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords, that he is the central person of the Godhead, the word. He is wisdom. And that who he is, and upon that revelation of who he is as the head, that's what the church is going to be built upon. Now, we know individually, Peter had the calling and he had the keys to unlock the door. He unlocked the door first for the kingdom to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. That's how it had to work. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up. What is it? Only a few hours before he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's hiding, hiding, hiding in the upper room for fear of the Jews. But when the Holy Spirit gets him, and there's the key, when the Holy Spirit gets him and he's filled with the Spirit of God and he overflows and he speaks in a new language. But more than that, don't just get excited about speaking in tongues. What else was there? What else was there on the day of Pentecost? Someone tell me. Power. What else happened? Fire. Who said that? You get the set of saucepans. That's you, Trelawney. <laughs> Fire. When the fire came, a literal fire that they could see as tongues of fire dancing on their heads and they spoke in new languages. But there was more. It says that there was a wind, like a mighty rushing wind 
went through the building and shook the building. But there was more. And when the Spirit of God came on them, they were out of control. They were like drunken men. They were, they were off their faces as the Spirit of God came on. It was observable. You could see what was happening. When Peter suddenly had the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire on him, he changed in his personality. And it says, and he stood up and he began to preach to the thousands in Jerusalem who gathered around to see the burning bush. Uh -huh. The signs, the wonders. The signs and wonders, there's no deep, deep theological meaning here. A sign is like a signpost, but a wonder is to make you wonder. So when you face a burning bush and when you face a Pentecost and when you see the fire, you go, whoa, what's happening here? And that's what happened in Jerusalem. So they stood up and then he preached to them and he said, you crucified the Messiah, the son of glory. And, he, and they were hit in their hearts with conviction, but they repented and they came through the door into the kingdom of God. That was to the Jews first. And the second keys that Peter had, we know, was in the house of Cornelius. And that was a different story, wasn't it? Peter wasn't as sure of himself there, but the Lord said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom, Peter. Go and unlock the door. And when he went to the house of Cornelius, what happens? Cornelius is a Roman. He's, um, he's a godly man. He prays. He he looks after his servants. He's hungry for the kingdom of God. And Peter has a vision before he goes there and he sees this thing where a sheet's hand brought down from heaven. And in the sheet, there's all these abominable animals you're not allowed to eat under the food laws. So there's things like turtles, you know, mouses, mice, <laughs> all those. There's certain animals that were abominable and you're not allowed to eat you know, pigs, all those sorts of things. And in the vision, the Lord says to Peter, rise up, kill and eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord, they're unclean, they're filthy. I can't touch them, I'm a Jew. And then he, he, the message comes three times and he keeps saying, no, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. And then as he's finishing the third time, there's a knock on the door and it's people from the house of Cornelius coming to him and saying, please come and talk to us. And then it says that the Lord had to say to Peter, go with these men. So Peter's reluctant. He's, he's thinking, no, these are Gentiles. These are Gentiles. They're filthy, Lord. They're filthy, filthy people. And he goes off to the house of Cornelius. And he's meant to use his keys to open the kingdom for the Gentiles. But what happens? It says that he was preparing a sermon, I know, that was, oh, I don't know why I'm here amongst you Gentiles. I'm a Jew. I have a lineage back to Adam. We are the godly chosen people of God, and I know Jesus, but you're, you're not going to have any part of this. He was going to, it says, as Peter opened his mouth, as he started to speak what he'd prepared, it said the Spirit of God fell on the house of Cornelius the same as it did on the day of Pentecost. And they were filled with the same Spirit and Peter observed exactly the same baptism that happened there. So there must have been fire, there must have been a shaking, there must have been drunkenness, there must have been the wind of God, there must have been the new languages. The same as it was in, on us in the beginning is the evidence. And Peter being the pompous snob that he was, said, didn't get to preach. I see that God is no respecter of persons. What is to stop these people from being baptised? <laughs> that's Peter opening the kingdom of God using the keys that he's got. 
and he did. And we know the story, we know the concepts now that Peter's standing at the pearly gates because of these scriptures. Peter's deciding who gets in and who gets out because he's got the keys of the kingdom. Well, I think Peter's already opened, used the keys of the kingdom. That's the individual message. The message to us is the big message. Because the message to us is that we have the keys of the kingdom. That the message that we get really clearly here is that Jesus says, and if you've got it in red in your Bible, it will show that Jesus said it. He said, I'm going to build my church on this rock. I will build my church on the evidence that I am the Christ. I am the anointed one. I am the Messiah. On this, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I think we've got to have some brainwashing. I think we've got to have a whole new concept of what it is to be a child of the king and the work that we've got to do. I said about you young people being radical. You've got to start to have confidence in the lordship of Jesus, his authority, his power. Your calling as an ambassador, as a diplomat, and the work that the Lord wants you to do. Now, I grew up an Anglican. I love the Anglican church. I love the liturgy. I love, you know, the seriousness. And I can remember, because my dad was the, the Anglican minister, I can remember in church every Sunday praying those prayers, Lord, um, I come to you now, wash me in my thoughts and in my deeds. You know, if there be any wicked way in me, bring me in the way everlasting. And, and some of the liturgy, and there was one particular thing where you'd often say, I am but a worm. How many of you, I, we're not worms, are we? No, right? I want you all to say with me, I am not a worm. We're not called to a God who's gone on holidays. We're not called to be men and women who just beg and can't look up to heaven, that we, that we have this inferiority complex as Christians, that we're full of misery. If you're not showing misery, you're not a real Christian. You know, some Christians look like they've been baptised in lemon juice. They're just, you know, they're very holy, but <laughs> they've missed it because they think they have to beg or they have to call out to God because he's in the heavens. And I am but a worm. I'm just down here, Lord. We've got to change our concepts. We've got to change our perspective to understand the call of God that's on us as the people of God. And the perspective that we have through this scripture here is that we've got work to do. And the investment and the authority that Jesus has put in us is one where he says, heaven listens to you. That when you bind things and you take that authority in earth and you know who you are and you know how you're called and you know the Holy Spirit is in you and you take that authority and you take that mantle like Elijah did and slam it on the waters and say, where is the God of Elijah? As Elisha did, sorry, not Elijah. That when you start to take those things and put them out and push, be one who seeks the kingdom of God and when you seek and you ask, and if it's slow in coming when you ask, then you go and knock, but then you kick the door down as well. That's what it's saying here. I remember my picture when I was praying, I am but a worm. I'd read this scripture and it was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You're going to build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against me. And my concept was, of me running down a hill with the gates of hell chasing me, trying to beat me over the head. That I had to be afraid of hell and of the devil. And, and, and the concept was of my littleness in thought, that I had to, 
avoid the gates of hell. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that with a church in full flight, aggressive, strategic, innovative, attacking, victorious, in all of this way, what happens is we are the ones that are approaching the gates of hell and we are the ones that are going to kick the doors down and we are the ones who with the call of God in these last days are going to take the land for the kingdom of God. That's what it's about. And I just think Mission Sunday, here we are. It's time to dream a dream. It's time to say, well, God, what do you want me to do with the years that I've got left in my life? You're not going to say, when I first felt the call of God come on me and I had a career and I was excited about my career, I was in the police force at the time and I was so, you know, I love the buzz. I love the fact that you could stick a siren on and I was 18 years old and they gave me a gun. They gave me a baton and they gave me a police car with a siren. At 18. <laughs> and they said, get out there, you represent the Queen. And they arrested people. I told people double, triple my age what to do. I, was at a, I could be at an emergency scene and be said, take control. Get out of there, you, you. You know, like it was, I love my job. And the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, Russell, it's time. I want you to serve me. And I said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. I will serve you. But let me do it when I'm 70. <laughs> Just let me have a little, I can be a Christian and a policeman. He said, yes, I know. And we need Christian policemen. He said, I've got other work for you to do. That was a difficult thing. But you know what? God's no man's debtor. He looks after you. And what you think you lose in your Isaacs, don't worry about it. You always gain. But it hurts at the time. It's no, hey, if authentic, if you're sincere in your heart and you let go, there'd be times when you just know it's going to hurt. And you know that you're living in a war zone and you know that there are battles. And you know that the call of God is going to cost you. And there's not always a happy ending. But I know who I believe in. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I just want to challenge you today to say, now's the time to get ready. Put your safety belts on. Now's the time where we're really going to find out what the call of God's about and where we're going and what's up ahead. And maybe God will wake you up in the middle of the night with a dream. Maybe he'll start to talk to you about people groups and things to do. But we want to be found as the people of God being about our father's business, not the lazy, not the one who buried the talent in the, and said, oh, I knew that you were a, a hard man, so I buried it. No, you can't sit on your pews. You can't sit on your talent. Now's the time to get up and run and work. For we've come to the kingdom at such a time as this. I'm just going to say that this morning, and I don't know, it's, I know that the sausages are going to get burnt if you hang around, but I would love to pray for some of you. I'm going to open the altar and say, listen, if you felt a conviction in your heart and you know that you feel really unsettled because of some of the things I'm saying and you need to make a fresh commitment to the Lord to say, like Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. If you need to do that, I'm going to open the altar. I'm going to be here till midnight if necessary. I will pray with you and we will agree together that your eyes will be open. Maybe there's just some stuff you have to get rid of. Maybe you need to leave something at the altar here. You need to do some business with God. 
maybe you have to go and put something right with somebody. Let's leave a slate that's clean. Let's make sure there's nothing between our heart and between the Lord's heart. Like I talked about that Sunday morning when the NPA were breaking through. You know, what would happen if that happened here? I'm sure your prayers would suddenly take a whole different flavour. And the rubbish that's hanging around, you'd sort it out pretty quick. I had it happen flying out of Manila one time when I was on the plane and we were fully loaded and we were we just the wheels had just lifted off and the pilot aborted. And he brought it back down and I could see with the lights that we were running out of runway. And I was thinking, Lord, this could be the moment. I started saying the Lord's Prayer because that's really good. And it sort of covers everything. But I tried to confess for all the sins that I could remember. And, there, and I realized there was a lot of them. <laughs> and I was running out of runway lights. I think we have to keep a short list. We have to be ready to go at a moment's notice. But we have to plan for the next 40 years. We have to have a heart that's open and a heart that is soft and it's just sorting that stuff out every day and that at the same time is ready for the keys of the kingdom to unlock doors. Father, we really thank you for this morning. We thank you again that, Lord, you love us. We don't have to worry about anything, Father. We thank you, it says in Isaiah 58, that for those that pour out their lives for the hungry, for those who give to the widows and to the orphans, that you promise to be a shield in front of them. You promise to be a shield behind them. And you promise as well, Lord, that the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Father, let that be upon us this morning. Lord, that as we are serious about serving you, Father, I just pray you'll provide, you will guide, you will show us what needs to be done. And Lord, we will serve you with joy. Bless this house. Father God, just bless this house. Look after these people. Lord, I thank you for Pastor Ronald and Ingrid. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for the times he rang me during COVID just to say, how are you going? Even my own denomination didn't do that. But I just thank you, Lord, for the way that he looked out for me as well. Lord Jesus, I just pray your richest blessings on this place, that it will be a fruitful vine and it will explode. This, this building will just be just too small for what it is. Lord, it'll be, they'll laugh about it because it'll just explode and they'll have to bust the walls out. Jesus, I just pray your richest blessing on it now. Father, as we go forward this week, that you will guide and speak to us in your precious name. Amen. Pastor Ronald. Praise God. Amen. You're blessed this morning. Yes, great word. Thank you, Pastor Russell. You know, just share, thinking of what Pastor Russell was, was sharing this morning, you know, there's a lot of work that we need to do. There's a lot of, you know, doors we can unlock. Even in our own community, even in our own nation. But just not only in our nation, but we're looking also into the nations of, of the world. I really want you to ask the Lord how you can get behind our missions program. You know, the the uh, orphanage in Sri Lanka, Beth Shalom, uh, it's only $50 a month. And I know some of some people who had committed during the early part of last year have sort of pulled back because of the COVID, and I fully understand all of that. But I really want you to pray and ask the Lord. We've got Cambodia, we've got Sri Lanka, we've got East Timor. And ask the Lord, where would you like to be involved? You know, because you're reaching souls, you're reaching out to the lost, the hurting, people who need Jesus in their lives. Just think, you know, he that had the Son had life. He that had not the Son, the wrath of God is upon them. Everyone standing outside Christ is going to a lost eternity. And really God wants us to 
to feel for the lost and reach out to the lost. So pray about it. Ask the Lord. I don't ask you for money. You pray and ask the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to get involved with the missions program of this church? Now I'll tell you what God will tell you. And we had a great missions program which was led by Pastor Val who went down to Cambodia with, with, with others of the church. You know, we had Pastor Ray that took a team also down and went to Sri Lanka. So we do have teams that we want to send and reach out to the lost. Talking about the Philippines, we really got a heart for Philippines too. We've got Filipinos in our church, you know. And I really believe that God will open the doors as we open our hearts. Amen. So I want you to pray this morning and ask the Lord, what would he want you to do? Perhaps he may not say anything to you. That's fine. But he says, you know, I want you to get behind and give, you know, one million dollars for such. Do it. You'll be blessed. You know, I know there are a couple of millionaires here. So ask the Lord. You know, don't just sit and, you know, throw your money here and there. Don't do that. We got a vision in this church. We want to reach the lost. God has given us a vision. Let's let's get behind it and do it. You know, call, talking about the call of God, that's exactly the series that we're doing in the church now. What we shared last Sunday, the Sunday before, about the call of God. So you just hit the nail, head, the nail on the head, you know. So let's pray. Come stand. Can we stand, church, this morning as we begin to pray? And you ask the Lord what the Lord wants you to do, how he wants you to get involved with missions of this church. And then Pastor Russell will be able to pray for you. So if you need prayer this, this morning, please do come up. There will be enough sausages and enough of, 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 of rolls, you know, to go all around. You can have twice, thrice, whatever. But uh, don't rush out because you want to go and, you know, have some sausages. We'll save some for you, okay? Father, we just want to thank you this morning. Lord, we are looking to you. You're the answers to all our prayers. You're the God of love and grace, wanting to reach out to others through us. And this morning, we want to thank you for your word. Lord, we believe that your word is spirit and life to us. And we thank you for speaking to us. Lord, you're moving upon our hearts. And we ask that you guide us and lead us by your spirit, Master, so that we can do your will and fulfill your will for our lives. And we thank you for that. Bless your people, Lord. Minister to their every need this morning. Lord, we thank you. We pray, Lord Jesus, for your healing power to flow through people this morning at this altar. Lord, that people's needs will be met. That people will commit their lives. And Father God, that you will do some wonderful things in the lives of your people. We believe that this morning. That as we come to you, Lord, no one goes, Lord, disappointed. Because you're a God who keeps your appointments. And Lord, you're a God who meets every need according to the riches in glory by your Son, Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you. We praise you this morning. We thank you for your word, Lord. It will never return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which you sent forth your word into our lives. So bless your word this morning to our hearts. Watch over us, protect us, bless our time of fellowship, Lord. Meet every single need once again, I ask, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. If you need prayer this morning, I want to encourage you to come up and Pastor Russell will pray with you. And he's got a great gift of, of prophecy over, over his life. And I believe God will speak into your life. Amen. Praise God. Amen.